All right. Welcome back to the Religion of Human Nature podcast. Uh, we have a great show today with two people who I know from different walks of life, but do a really amazing thing. The first is Sarah Eisen, who is the co-anchor of Closing Bell. Sarah, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. It's very good to be on. Love it. I actually- I actually believe I was your one of yours, at least first bosses at Camp Ramara when you, you were what, a counselor. I was uh, you. I was the head road the, sport, the head of sports. Yes. Oh, right. Of course. <laughs> I was on sports staff. It's a blur. I was an aerobics instructor. Really. Which put me on on sports staff, but I'm not sporty at all. I was also <laughs> an aerobics instructor. You were. No. <laughs> Imagine if I was though, that would be so crazy. I, how did they have an aerobics class at your camp? Step aerobics. I had to get Step certified. Class. I did like seven hours of aerobics per day. I was in the best shape of my life. <laughs> I don't think I've done aerobics since that summer. It's funny because like that, I remember that the summer you're speaking of those, I mean, that general period, those step, that step gimmick was like a huge part. Of, it was like pop culturally huge. Like everybody was like, all the moms in the neighborhood were like stepping and stepping. So you well, did the step class. Naturally. So I did the step class. And, <laughs> and because I was on sports staff, you as my boss, I remember used to make me sweep the basketball courts. Well, it was I had a, nothing to do with them. <laughs> it was a part of, I think it was a part of the gig or Thank I didn't want to do it. It was one of the two things. <laughs> You're pay, paying your dues. <laughs> you were and a then, good boss. Yeah. And then we had, thank you. And then we had, we have Stu Stone, who is a filmmaker and director and all those wonderful things. Uh, I found him through the Jack of All Trades, but uh, which is uh, an awesome movie. Uh, Stu, how are you today? Besides I'm good. aerobics. I'm well. I wish I had an exciting like aerobics story. I, <laughs> I uh, was once a kid actor in an aerobics movie called Heavenly Bodies. It was like the quintessential 80s aerobics movie. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I remember Very that. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So let's dive into it. Our topic today is trusting the news because both of these two individuals have unique perspectives on that. One who's on TV doing it and the other is making films that actually, you know, report on topics that people care about, especially Stu's current project. So Sarah, I want to direct the first question to you. Many people are skeptical of the news shows today uh, that aren't their source, uh, right? So um, for example, CNN versus, you know, Fox. How do you keep the trust of your viewers? So I anchor a show on a financial news network on CNBC. So the first thing I would say is that I stay true to our bias, which is always going to be telling the story to investors. And there's always going to be a business angle or an economic angle. And I know that that's why they come to me and they watch our show, the viewers. And so it's, it's part of how we establish trust. The other thing is you just can't get caught up in the echo chamber. I can control what I report, what I say, how I present it, and, and people can, can judge. And I am always trying to do that. Honestly, I think there's not a lot of political noise and sort of cable news yelling and screaming at each other because of what we do in financial news. And because we're always looking for that, that angle of the story um, we, we have become a, a big trusted brand in business news at CNBC. And that's what I try to uphold every single day. I also do a ton of homework and I'm always re researching for interviews and I'm always researching stories that I'm covering and stocks that are being mentioned. So as long as I can, can present with some background knowledge and some of the homework that I do, then that helps, I think, also establish trust with the viewers. Sure, is there is there a can Go I ask sort of a question? Is there like yeah. a whole is there like a whole other pressure involved when you're dealing with financial news specifically? I mean, there's probably like a lot riding on these stories financially. Like people listen to what you report and they're like, oh, sell, buy. It's like, is there a 100%. really small margin for error? A hundred percent. So so we are very aware of that responsibility that other people's money is at stake. And I think it comes into how we talk about markets. We try not to overhype anything or, you know, we try to just lay it out, the facts yeah. and, and present a lot of experts. You know, I'm, I'm not giving opinions very specifically on yeah. stocks or on companies. It's not my job, but I'm trying to interview the best people and get different sides so that people can make their own decisions around their own investments. And it's not just that pressure. We're also covering companies, which 
their stocks move sometimes based on what we say or based on interviews we give. So it is incumbent on me and on us to present really good, well-researched, well-thought-out questions and stories around the different stocks and the different businesses that we're covering. Absolutely, we're aware. We also have rules where we can't talk about certain stocks if they're below a certain threshold. I think it's a half a billion dollar market cap or something because those stocks are very, very sensitive to what goes on to CNBC. Right, and what we just saw in in, uh, the economy with, let's say, GameStop and stuff, those were so volatile for such a short period of time that at any slight... But that's not a traditional. That's not a traditional story, right? That's like an anomaly that like kids got away with whatever the hell that was, right? It's still going on. I, yeah. it's it's definitely a new phenomenon. We've never, I've never seen anything like it. In my I, think it's like a, I, I think it's like a, a residue or a residual effect of this like flip economy that's been going on with this young sort of generation. Not to mention the cryptocurrency bonanza. They've seen how that works, so it's like. You know, they, it's, somebody figured out a way to game the system, so to speak. And as long as they're, I don't know, it's, is it legal? I don't even know. It's all legal. What we think yeah. is legal, what they're doing. The SEC is looking into the GameStop stuff to make sure that nobody is, you know, that, that, that first of all, there's no pump and dump schemes. There's no um, right. sort of manipulation going on behind the scenes, but it's all new because it's being driven by social media, which is, which yeah. is just crowdsourced ideas. And but but one, one, one it's positive good, is you know? it's, it's driving a lot of interest in That's financial. What I'm saying. It's, it's, good it's good to do because yeah. it's I have more eyeballs on you because you got the story. But I also think as somebody who's, I watched your show after I saw that we were going to be on here. And I think that obviously I'm not your target demographic, but I did find it to be very interesting because as somebody who would maybe dabble in investing, I'm like throwing darts at a dartboard. I don't know what the hell's going on. So you to have a place where- CNBC. <laughs> so, so I'm saying like to hear, to, to watch and see what you do and see that you, you do kind of just like tell the story. I didn't find it to be, I didn't find it to be like salesy at all. I felt it to be more like oh, yeah. here's what's going on. And that. That's just, directly to the question. And, and there's one, like there's nothing worse than someone investing in something that they don't understand or don't know. And so, it's, you know, watching you, you, you get a chance to at least learn something before you just blindly play the game. That's what they want. They want people to blindly play the game. That's how they make money. Right. So, anyway, and- I was just complimenting you on, on Thank the fact you. that I I'm watched- I'm glad it. we have a new viewer. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. night we did. That on night. Target Demo, although everyone who's interested in, in business, investing the economy. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> and, and so that's, you know, part of the story here that we're trying to talk about is, you know, trusting this news. So Stu, you, you are a filmmaker and who also tells stories. How do you ensure that your story is being told accurately and something that people can relate to? So just knowing your uh, current project with, uh, where I think there's a lot of interest in sort of these behind the scenes, what has happened in the wrestling world um, or with your own film, were there moments where you wanted to stay very true to the story and it, and it goes away? And how do you make it also relatable? Because not everyone- um, Yeah, you know, no, I hear you. I mean, there's like, a, there's like a trust factor that's lacking a lot in, I guess, Hollywood, especially, because you, know, you don't want like the facts to get in the way of good storytelling. And you see a lot of these movies that are like based on a true story that are like very loosely based on a true story where it's like, this shit didn't even happen, <laughs> like, but it makes a better movie. Um, when you're doing a documentary, you're there's you're scrutinized way more, right? Um, so you have you have to have the facts as part of your story, or else what's the point of of doing your documentary? Now a lot of documentaries are just like sugar coated, like op eds. Like someone has an opinion on something and they want you to agree with their opinion, and they'll just like put out a viewpoint for like eighty minutes and hammer you over that of a viewpoint. Like that's not the kind of movie I made. Uh, Jack of all trades was more of like an expose on like the trading card industry and the bubble that was in the late '80s and early '90s that popped, and what it did to the collectors, what it did to the companies, what it did to my family personally. My family owned eleven baseball card shops at one point. Like we were all in on baseball cards. Obviously, there's a huge resurgence right now that has happened with baseball cards, almost to the point where uh, Sarah should be reporting about baseball cards. I'd be happy to come on her show. No, and talk. I know it's part of the the hype. It's part of the Bitcoin yeah. mania. Yeah. I and mean, everything is just going for crazy money. Like, like right I'm, I'm the baseball card guy. Like I did the baseball card movie that like helped spark this whole 
frenzy because my movie got on Netflix and then everybody wanted their baseball cards again. Yeah, it's great. It's crazy. I mean, there's other factors too. I can't take all the credit, but definitely having a, a documentary about old baseball cards on Netflix while everybody was locked in their house and everybody watched it made them go dig in their boxes. Now, a lot of people ignored the facts that I laid out, which was that it was kind of a scam back then. <laughs> they don't care. People don't care. They don't want, they don't care if it's a scam. They want to play the game. Um, and it's not a scam, but I'm just saying there was like some nefarious things that went on back in the day. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's even more. Listen, greed, wherever there's money to be made, there's a story to tell. And agree. usually it's like a story that would blow your mind because like the people that get rich quick, what they did to get rich quick is probably a very fascinating <laughs> tale that you wouldn't want to endure <laughs> um and then i had a whole personal connection with my father which is the thing you said like how do i make a baseball card movie that is well, everybody wants to watch it i guess but there was a whole other angle like you know after the baseball card business kind of popped the bubble popped my dad like disappeared and i didn't he just took off and so when i went and found my old baseball cards a lot of the questions that needed answering were only he could answer them so in the film, I reconnected with him and hadn't spoken to him in, you know, however many years. And it was a pretty emotional thing. Now, here's, a, here's an example of facts in fiction. How do you do that? I, I spoke to my father for 90 minutes. You saw 15 minutes in the movie. Editing is part of the reason why a movie like seems like it's too convenient, you know? But you have to edit a movie. It can't, you can't, no one's gonna watch my story for four hours. It has to be like 85 minutes. So it's like, there's only room to tell that story for 15 minutes. So what 15 minutes do I want to put in there? Well, now I'm controlling the narrative because I can decide what I want the people to see. I could decide what if my dad said something I didn't like. I don't have to put it in. If I, you know, I'm allowed to kind of decide what facts are going to go out into the world. And believe me, there was like a lot way heavier stuff that I didn't include in his story, but I, I, I pretty much put like most of my cards on the table. And I think that's why people related to the movie so much because, you know, in the end, I'm not the only one that went through something like this. Millions, unfortunately, there's a generation of kids that have from people got divorced. It was like a big thing and <laughs> probably still is, but it was pretty big back then. It was pretty uncommon when I was like really young, nobody got divorced. Then all of a sudden, like everybody was just getting divorced. And I was, you know, part of that whole thing. So anyway, enough about my, childhood trauma but uh i addressed it that's a different, that's a different I, I in some ways and i think that's the thing it was cathartic for other people to sort of you know people like to live vicariously through other people and try to you know at least they didn't have to do what i did so i think when we when we talk about news and what i think has always been true is that common sense becomes the ultimate filter right whenever i watch something you know you know, especially when it comes to news, especially around, let's say, politics, which we don't, I don't, we don't necessarily have to get into. It's almost like I'm the viewer to to cut through it, right? If you saw what's going on GameStop, the common sense is to say you have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. You could lose every single dollar you put into it, right? So, but today with so many different news sources and so many different opinions, is it still on the viewer? or the presenter to understand the full scope of the story. So Sarah, maybe to you, when you're, when you're presenting a story, even on, let's say, you know, a stock, is it, do you, you, you know, I think the way you laid it out earlier was great, but does, do you and your, your team want to present a full scope or do you want to have an angle and a slant so that, and let the viewer decide? I think it's a little bit of both and a little bit of neither. So we, when we, when we, when we take on stories, um, for instance, there's a stock in the news off earnings, right? Campbell's soup. I'm just trying to think of a kind of boring example. Campbell's soup reports earnings. It's a beat on $3 per share when the analysts were expecting $2. If I, if I said that, if I presented the story like that, how I just did, that's boring and you wouldn't watch. But if I said, people are staying at home and eating canned soup again, that, then, you, then that would be something resonant. So is that an angle? Sure, it's an angle. It's based on our read of the numbers and our work on, on what was just reported in the earnings report. Um, and, and 
it's not, it, there, there's no slant there. It's just based on our read. And, and by the way, if there were questions about whether this was a really good quarter or if the company is doing poorly, we'd probably get on the phone with an analyst or two or the company itself and say, what's really going on here so that we can share that story in, in a pretty informed, legit way where ultimately the audience, whether it's an investor or just someone interested, it's on them to understand whether they're going to make an investment or formulate a view about something. But at least what we can say is that we told it in an accurate way and in an interesting way and gave the viewer a slice. Now, in TV world, that Campbell soup story is going to be 25 seconds, which to Stu's point, you know, took us an hour to report or two hours to report. So we're going to pick what we're going to tell the audience. It's not going to be complete. We're not going to give the margins. We're not going to give the guidance numbers, but we're going to give the, the, the nuts and bolts of the story. And so as a TV journalist, of course, I cannot give the full scope of anything, um, but, but I can, I can try to give an accurate and, really what my, my purpose is to give, give the viewers a nugget that they can take and that they can pull and they can talk about with their friends or they can research further um, or they can go find an analyst note or, or they can just you know read about it in the Wall Street Journal, but they have a tangible nugget to take away that they understand about the story. And that's what I'm, when I'm after, it's on them to figure it out. But, but also like Nobody's going to understand the full scope of any story, no matter what, even if it's a 10 page article in the New York Times, because that's going to be subjective about what they're covering anyway, and what kind of angle and who they spoke to and who they didn't speak to. That's all part of the news. Um, and there's so many different sources too. So you can get it in different ways, but nobody is sitting there and reading in the same article in six different papers and then thinking, okay, let me try to cut to the chase of what's really going on. You know, we, we, we go places where we tend to agree with the angle or the slant. And in my world, I'm lucky, I don't really do political opinion stuff. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to attract that kind of audience. And so I, I don't feel that I'm responsible for them thinking a certain way because sure. what I'm just doing is trying to give the, the facts. What about social media? How much does that play a role for both in both of your lines of work? For presenting the truth, um, did Stu, did, did people, let's say on social media, maybe take or or slant some of the things from your your shows or documentary? Uh, Sarah, do, does it, do you ever read things on social media, or maybe you don't read on social media, but it's presented to you that they're just like that is not what we said, <laughs> or or they've taken a run with it in a way that I'm not talking about. Uh, I was joking about this earlier in the season with with someone. I'm not talking about you know. Sam8964217, who doesn't actually have a real profile, but I'm talking about people who really can slant behavior and, and opinion. I mean, definitely, I mean, that's, yes, social media is, affects everything. Yes, it's like 100% yes. Um, you know, listen, and it's really weird because there's certain people that I follow on Twitter that like, I trust more than the news. It's like, I'm like, I get my news from that guy's feed. Um, I don't know with who that guy is. I just like, he's got a blue check mark. I kind of like what he writes and it's sort of like a new way to sort of find stuff, but there's never been so much. There, there's such access to information. There's it's unlimited. Like there's stories that tell you both sides of the story. If you depends on how you search it. So at the end of the day, it's like up to people to make up their own mind and not just follow the pack. And try to make their own sort of common sense. Like you said, common sense ultimately needs to prevail. And I mean, in the end it did politically, I think, I don't know. But, uh, you know, the last five years we've been conditioned that fake news, fake news, nothing's real, nothing's real. I mean, that's not true. Like there are elements of news that are for entertainment. There are people who literally go on TV on prime time and like it's presented maybe news-ish, but it's really for entertainment. It's political commentary. It's, it's Stephen Colbert with less jokes. It's you know, uh, you know, Seth Meyers does his opening monologue. You can learn the news from watching that. <laughs> it's like, he's really telling you the news. He's just like telling jokes with it. So it's all just a way to get people to watch, uh, you know, certain channels. But the one thing is that when something bad happens in the world, everybody does trust the news. As soon as the virus hit, everybody's watching the news to see what to do. As soon as if there was God for, you know, God forbid something happens, the first place you go is, the news is still trusted at the end of the day. 
like no matter how many, how much noise there is out there, there's a certain responsibility when, when, when stuff really matters, you have to be able to trust CNN and Fox and CNBC, everybody, they have a responsibility. And I feel like at the end of the day, uh, that still matters. And I think it does matter like to them too. I don't think that they're like telling us complete lies. I think there's opinionated news, but I don't think we're getting like, the sun is gray and it's really not. And unless I'm crazy. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. I mean, I think social media is a really, it's a really powerful tool in what I do. Um, there's, there's a lot of truth in it and there's a lot of nonsense and, and, and false information and noise um, it just it just amplifies everything basically. And what I use it for is I follow fellow journalists because I, I find sometimes they they share tidbits of reporting that doesn't make it into stories or comes before stories. I follow all the news outlets, which I think is a good way to see what what different competitors are covering, but also um, news sources are covering. And I follow some, you know, news makers are on social media. So our, our president, even though it's our former president tweeted a lot more, but that was a huge part of what I, of covering him. Of, and, and by the way, it moved the stock market. So I needed to be on his Twitter feed at all times. So we it's a did. primary we news. All, we were all hooked on it. <laughs> Not me. No, I, to be honest, I never followed him. I did. Uh, and it had nothing to do with my own political beliefs. I just knew that it w my, I wanted my blood pressure at a certain level. <laughs> I mean, I was like the first thing that I would check when I wake up in the morning. Yeah, like, that's not good, Stu. That wasn't, that wasn't too. <laughs> And I needed to. And, and, yeah. and, and, you know, we would, breaking news, President Trump has tweeted this. Oh, he and knew how to get attention, for sure. It's yeah. interesting because like using just him as sort of an example, but there's something in social media that's common to both of our worlds. And that is that like these influencers can sway the public in a way that affects both of our worlds. I mean, you have these kids tweeting out, oh, GameStop, just cop it. And like, they all go and they buy it. There's I in my world that you have like Gary Vee being like, buy LeBron James cards. And like, everyone's like, wow, oh, we got to do that. Or like Elon Musk tweets out something, you know, there's certain, there's certain people that have that power and Trump had it for a long time, but they literally have it's a power by the numbers. If you have a million people listening to your message, you really only need 10% to actually do what you're asking them to do. And you make, that's real numbers. It's like 10% of the people, if 90% of the people, if I tweet out buy Samsung TVs to a, a million people and nine out of 10 people think I'm just like a con man or something, I don't need those nine people. The one out of 10, you scale that up to, I've got a million people following me. I can make real money. So <laughs> I don't know if I just... If that made well, sense, true, right? it, 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 that social media plays a role. It's in, a numbers game, in the, literally. Yeah, in, in the truth, um, and who yeah. and who owns it? I mean, you um, can lie. You can a, a lie is only powerful when one person believes it. And if you were taking a ratio that only one out of ten people believe a lie, that's a big number. It sounds like small when you say one out of ten, but when you're tweeting out to fifty million people one out of 10 is a scalable thing that actually now you have a group of people that believe that lie. So it's, you know, the truth is, it is, it's, it's tough. It's tough to like, that's going to be a major, it'll be a major problem for the Facebooks and the Twitters and the and Google YouTubes of the world. And they're going to be heavily scrutinized. They already are under regulatory scrutiny for whether they are responsible for the content on their, on their sites and w w whether it's, it provokes violence, whether it's just fake news, false information about vaccines, whatever it is, there's been a million examples and they continue to get pounded by this and they're trying to clean it up. And no matter what, they can't because it's part of their business model. Yeah, there's and money There's money in fake news. Yeah. Well, there I mean, there will, there, there has to be a change. Whenever, whenever there's a new industry, there has to be reg regulations that come on behind it eventually. And I'm not saying it today or tomorrow, but um, because uh, we will get to a point where there'll be too much negative. I don't, I don't know that, and sadly, we're not at the, probably that threshold yet, but I mean, I, I, speaking of movies we saw on Netflix over you know, this last year, The Social Dilemma had a massive impact on this country. Um, I don't know one person who watched it. I, I was more scared of that than COVID. I, I mean that seriously, not that I wasn't scared of COVID, but what it could do long-term scared scared me 
especially sitting in my home and all I had to do was be on the computer, right? Um, it, it became, and I think that guy's on something that we have to figure out a way to, uh, to not, um, I mean, there's mental health issues behind this. There's, there's all sorts of repercussions that if we don't take some sort of responsibility in this truth, that and 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 fight against also like blind hatred which exists on these platforms in really horrible horrible fashion I mean, those though that that stuff though existed without social media social media just amplified it because now we can see it it's yeah like, and you can't but you couldn't you the the young the nine-year-old kid couldn't find it with the click of a button i mean if a nine-year-old's like looking for hate speech online you might want to figure out what's going on with that nine-year-old well, yeah, well, so there's other talks. That there's a, a friend of mine, Kristen Pic, uh, Piccolini. I don't know if you ever any of you run into, but he's a reformed neo-Nazi, and his story is incredible. And what he does is he goes and he speaks to individuals one on one. He won't. He won't. He doesn't. He doesn't go group. To, I mean, his point isn't to do group speak and things like that. So God forbid someone's child is under the parents see what's going on. He will fly to their house and meet with them one on one and tell him, them his story, which is, I, I, I really suggest people like, I hope to have him on the, the show at some point. Um, he's an incredible speaker, human being, to, but uh, his message is incredibly powerful. I want to, I want to have one more question, which is, so we both, you both present facts and stories, and those things can come into conflict. How do we as individuals, let's say me, remain invested in the stories without jeopardizing facts? You want to take us or me? <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear your answer. <laughs> well, for me and, and for journalists I respect and follow, it's about finding stories in the facts. Facts come first and, and you know, a lot of what I cover is just securities and stocks trading up or down or the economy, you know, telling a data point that's better or worse. But the drama is about the narrative and it's about f people, it's about characters, it's about um, context, it's about money, and, and it's about finding those stories in the monotony of, of daily stock moves and data points that I find really, really compelling stories. And we do it every single day. And so to me, it's not really a conflict. It starts with the facts and you can tell really great stories in there. I love that. Start with the facts, lead with, lead with the truth or the facts and then and find the stories in there. Stu, anything to add? Yeah, I would say like most of the time, like I'm, I'm, I'm not in that business. Like I'm just in storytelling. And like the facts don't really matter because I'm just telling a story and it's like escapism for people to watch a movie and like doesn't have to have facts. But when I'm doing documentary work or I'm working like I'm working for Vice right now, now I'm kind of have to wear a journalistic hat and there's more responsibility with that type of storytelling and facts do matter. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's tough. It can be very tough. It's very hard to editing a movie is very hard and certain facts get in the way, who knows? Like I'm not speaking on my own behalf, but I definitely, as someone who's seen how Christmas works, I like, <laughs> I don't know, that was the worst analogy, but you understand like, I, I know what goes on behind the curtain. So I, I watch things with a different lens than normal people do because I'm like, oh, that's, yeah, that's edited. That's not, that's- but Don't you, you know, find like, too that sometimes the best stories are the ones rooted in the deepest facts, the ones that are based on true, true life. The, like the, the documentaries to me that make the biggest impact on my psyche are the ones that are totally true and and yeah. that have happened and and maybe that's just my journalistic bias but, but like, I think those ones have like a little bit of like hollywood magic in sure i don't know about all that well i mean because listen put it this way if i showed up at your house and i'm not a reformed neo-nazi but i do come and visit people one-on-one -on -one. <laughs> if i was to come to your house sarah and me and you were going to talk and i have two cameras on us you're aware that there's a camera on you Sure. Like there's, unless I'm shooting a hidden camera where you're like really wall is completely down, I'm only going to get that version. That's like the red light version of you. There are exceptions to that rule where there's people that are just like, don't give a, an, an SH and like they have no filter. Those are beautiful people to have in the documentary. 
<laughs> but, but you know, they're it's, you got a mind for those types. Yeah. Um, I guess I find that document, there are two types of documentaries in my head and, and the journalistic ones, I think make a bigger impact where say, you know, there were two, <laughs> There were two fire festival docs and one of them, the, the central character was paid and the other one, it wasn't paid. And I thought he wasn't paid. And the one where he wasn't paid to me was a lot more powerful. And Which one was the one that was good. Huh? Which one is the good one? I thought the good one was the one where he wasn't paid. Well, which one's that? Like, I don't remember. That was Netflix, I the, think. Is that the one where the guy like, uh, like had to get water for the festival and had to do what he had to do? Yes. That's the good one. That's the good one. Yeah, that's the good one. Because otherwise you get some version of where this, where he was, pay, Billy was paid. And so he got, you got his version of the story. Right. It was a little more biased right. and it was a little less to me truthful. Right. I mean, yeah. I mean, I guess there's like seven sides to every story. So people have to figure it out. I mean, to me, I, I really like got caught up in the true crime documentary stuff that's going on. And, uh, you know, the staircase and making a murderer and the jinx, these are all like really amazing just experiences to, uh, to watch. And I uh, was sitting with my partner and we were watching making a murder specifically. And it was like, wow, this is like, how much of this is produced? Like, it's so perfect. Like the way that the story just unfolds is just like, you can't ask for something better. And then I remembered like when I was shooting my documentary, like, that's just what happens. Like God knows or something that you're like making a documentary and like just delivers you gold. Um, so we actually shot a movie that's coming out soon, which is nothing like my last movie, but it's sort of like a satire on the true crime documentary genre. So it's like, basically there's this like unsolved potential killer and like me and my brother-in-law are the ones that are gonna like find him. So we already shot this movie it's like coming out. It's already out in Canada. It's doing pretty well there, but it's going to come out in the States in a few months. I'd love for you guys to check it out, but it, it kind of really delves into this topic that we're talking about today, which is like what's real and what's not real. Because like I presented something that's sort of 50 50 and it's uh, I guess you'll have to see it, but it's really directly based on this exact principle of, of we're just being fed things like what's real, what's not real. That's a great, that's a great, we will check it out. It's a great way it's to end. Faking, it's called faking a murderer. Faking a murderer. Perfect. Yeah. It's a great, that's a great plug. I want to thank both of you. It was a great conversation, Stu. I appreciate your time. Yes. And Sarah, it's, it's so great to see you again after all these yeah. years. And you're doing, you're doing great stuff. Yeah, Sarah, if you ever want to talk baseball cards, you let me know. <laughs> they're hot right now. I know they're getting a lot of money and attention. I give, I, I give great sound bites. You let me know. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.